welcome to Cannabis Business Minds Podcast with your host, Simone Samaluka Radzin. Join me where I'll take you inside the ins and outs of this brand new and exciting business called cannabis. Connect with me on Calagia.com and follow us on social media as well. And here's today's show. So today we talk with Carolyn Pars, entrepreneur, business coach, and branding guru. As a 26-year-old, Carolyn launched her first business, Poochie Canine Couture, a company that manufactured and designed fashion pet accessories and apparel. Poochie sold in over a thousand department stores, pet stores, and chains nationwide, including Bloomingdale's, Neiman Marcus, Macy's, Harrods of London, Target, and many more. And after just four years, Pucci was acquired by a much larger corporation. Currently, Carolyn is a certified marketing and business coach, and she works one-on-one with entrepreneurs and executives internationally. She is also the co-author of the Green Marketing blog, an exploration, explanation, and exposition of what you need to know to be successful in marketing your green product or service. Carolyn and her products have appeared on television shows such as Good Morning America, ABC News, CBS News, on numerous radio channels, uh, and on cable shows such as HBO, CNN, and Lifetime. She's been featured in print coverage in the New York Times, LA Times, Wall Street Journal, Chicago Tribune, People Magazine, and and Cosmopolitan. I personally have had the pleasure to work with Carolyn on a few projects, including our January Cannabis Women's Empowerment Summit in Santa Monica, where she taught a branding workshop, as well as I was able to be a participant in her online coaching program. Carolyn, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Great to be here, Simone. Finally. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Finally. Um, But, you know, we said this a little bit offline, but like after reading your bio, I was really in awe of all of your accomplishments and what you were able to do just at such a young age of being able to, you know, build and sell a company so quick and then what you've been able to do since then. Um, and I was hoping you could just spend, you know, some time talking about your entrepreneurial journey uh, and how you got to where you are today. Yeah. Well, it first started with the lemonade stand, you know, many years ago. <laughs> Actually, it wasn't lemonade. It's st- This is where my entrepreneurial thing, I, I think I, found the gene in me we were doing a like all the kids in the neighborhood put their like garage sale like everybody pulled out of their house what they could sell we were like 10 Mm -hmm. and we put it all out there and nobody was coming and I was like huh you know one straggly person come through so I said you know what why don't we get our pots and pans and I played Fife back then and we'll do a parade through the neighborhood and let everybody know that we have what we have to sell. And that began my marketing career. <laughs> so, um, well, then I, you know, I, that was like a little seed. And then, of course, after school, when I went to college, I took a advertising writing class. And I said, that was the easiest and funnest A I ever got. So, hence... As soon as I left uh, college, I hit Madison Avenue. You know, I, I'm a New Yorker, and I went right to Madison Avenue, the big times, and I got a job as a receptionist at a little agency called John Paul, Paul Itta. But he had large accounts um, like Cody Perfume and Aer Lingus. And since it was such a small agency, I got to, you know, work on everything as a young one, honed my skills, found out I had a writing, copywriting talent. And then after John Pulitzer, I hit, I was with larger companies in, in, on Madison Avenue and then was, and learned branding. I learned the importance of a brand because when you're dealing with the big guys, right, like that, everything, there, there's a phrase that says your brand is your equity. And it's not necessarily what you make, whether it's a, you know, uh, a computer or shoes, right? It's the inherent equity and personality of that brand. The name is what where the where the um, the like the value is, right? And what it stands for in the marketplace. And I got taught that at a very young age. So after a few years on Madison Avenue, my then husband and I said, "Hey, we should be doing this for ourselves, right? I mean, we we come up with all these great ideas." for everybody else, let's do it ourselves. And that is when Poochie, which it was a, one of the very first pet 
you know, fashion companies. Now we have a thousand of them, right? They're everywhere, but not back then. And so we had two, my kids at the time were my two dogs. Mm -hmm. And I saw that at Christmas time, I used to macrame collars to my, my dog and people would say, oh, can you make me one? And I'm like, okay. And then I kept on macrame collars and I thought, gee, there's something about this, <laughs> you know, right? Because there's nothing out there except for nylon collars and leashes. And so um, my partner and I decided to put together the first line of fashion pet accessories and we went with our little bag, you know, store to store. There was one, there was one boutique in Manhattan, just one. And it was called Karen's for People and Pets. And she bought our collars and leashes. And that was the beginning of Poochie, which after four years, we did sell it to a very large corporation. But it was, um, it was in the early days and it was new, and it was a way for people to adorn part of their family, their pets, that, that there wasn't back then anything to, to give them other than milk bones, right? Mm -hmm. So we hit a nerve, right? We, hit a, you know, we found a niche that wasn't being served at all, and basically this is an entrepreneur, right? This is what entrepreneurs do, and then they, you find a way to serve it well, and if you happen to hit it right, and with the timing and all, it could grow into a really healthy business for you yeah that's interesting so I mean if we just kind of stay on that concept for a second I mean so you obviously identified a problem you knew that you could do it because people were saying hey I love this kind of stuff you get in your first you know store but then how do you get from that first store and how much of that had you put into what did you say you know when you got in that first store you were very comfortable with your brand like had you branded everything to the point where it was then when you sold it or how did that brand evolution work from idea to first store to sell yeah great question absolutely not <laughs> you know it was <laughs> not all figured out at all i had I knew how to brand, right? I mean, that was my strength. Marketing was my strength, but I had no idea how to make a collar or a leash or anything like that. So that was a learning curve. Mm. Um, but as far as the name stuck, right? We came up with the name, which was Poochie, rhyme with Gucci. This really works out. So there was that, right? Yeah. And we call, you know, you know, it's, it's important, what, like the name you have. There's also... Uh, different types of naming like uh, what we call in marketing the name is the claim when you have right in your name mm -hmm. what you do right mm -hmm. so people get it like that and that's so important with SEO search engine op optimization today so but yeah our first collars and leashes you know how much they were and this is back you know years ago they were like a hundred two hundred dollars they were way high-end we hired this fashion designer to do this buckle and it was so they were super expensive and we sold like five you know <laughs> and I'm like huh <laughs> this is we overestimated yeah. what the market would bear mm -hmm. right and so we said okay but we didn't stop there because we knew we hit something we knew that there was interest but we just didn't the first line we came out with was too over the top so we decided to, what I did was I looked at the children's market, right? Whatever that was happening fashion-wise in the children's market, because it's the same kind of emotional thing. It's the cute factor, mm -hmm. and it's still like your kid, right? Dressing up your kid. Yeah. So I started kind of mimicking, like fashion prints were big back then. And so what we did was we found, we went to fabric, right? Collars and leashes. And we uh, matched what was happening. There were Hawaiian prints, and then we had, uh, uh, you know, animal prints, which really worked on a dog. And then our price point, that's, this was the second round, our price point went down to like $15, right? Wow, or, or under 20 And we, we really... Uh, we really saw that our sales just went up. Instead of making five, I was making, you know, a hundred, right? And selling in. How did I sell in? Literally, I went store to store back then. Now, I'm just, I'm going to date myself because this was pre-internet, right? Yeah. So we, you know, you got on the phone, right? And yeah. you went store to store. You went to trade shows, right? That happened 
a year or so later. But first, I lived in a you know I lived in the New York area, so I could go to stores, and I found out that some of the pet stores back then were not like what they are today. They were like kind of smelly pet stores, right? And so some of those pet buyers were like, uh, I don't think this is going to work, right? Like, lady, get a life. Yeah, and yeah. so I said, you know, okay, so probably I have to look for the ones that are in more upscale neighborhoods. That was first thing. And then I said, what about department stores? Because at, you know, the, la the end of the year, Christmas time comes and people buy stuff for their pets, right? So, and they may not go into a pet shop, but they're going to go into a department store, yeah. right? So I said, okay, I'm going to start talking to gift buyers at department stores, right? And they didn't, I, my first department store, I think it was Macy's, right? And Macy's didn't know where to put me. They were like, wait, should you put you here? Should we put you there? So it was a gigantic experiment. Oh, wow. And so it, we were really trailblazers back then because it wasn't out there and we just made something better. We just created a whole new category. And That's then we made, we made sweaters that this was the big break for us, okay? Yeah. So we started making dog sweaters, and I made one sweater that was kind of like, um, you know, Betsy Johnson is a very famous fashion designer, and I had this sweater that was a dress that had all these um, – a handprint marks all over it, right? And they, it was really cute. People used to compliment me all the time. I said, you know, I should make a sweater with paw prints all over it, just like this, you know? Mm -hmm. So I did a rendition of that, and I made a sweater for the dog and a matching sweater for people, right? That is what, like, that was such a sellout, and I went and I placed it in the Spiegel catalog at the time, and they direct, they did a test and they ordered like a couple of, you know, a couple of dozen from me. And yeah. then they dropped their catalog, which, which means they, um, they mailed it yeah. and they tested it out. Yeah. And from that test, they knew how to be, how to, how many, and there were hundreds and hundreds that they ordered after that. And I'm like, Oh my God, now I got to make these things. Right. <laughs> so, but I, thousands and thousands came through that and I as a matter of fact our product in the in the Christmas Spiegel catalog outsold Peter Max and I thought all oh, right Pucci has made a mark and that was our that was when we, we just went to a whole new level and realized what was really important with price points right mm -hmm. so it had to be under 20 bucks mm -hmm. except for the human sweaters they were over that amount but um Anything over the amount of twenty or twenty five dollars was just like it, it, it wasn't you know, I mean you could do a specialty, but it wasn't really selling, you know, in, in any kind of quantity. And I would go to these gift shows and, and these pet shows and this one guy who was standing next to me in a booth at a gift show said, He goes, If you sell to the classes, you live with the masses. But if you sell to the masses, you live with the classes. And I'm thinking, oh, all right, how do I? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I had this one. Remember, I had that really high end thing. It's like nobody bought it, right? So I reversed my thing and tried to bring, still deliver fashion, still deliver the cute factor, but bring in the price point. I'm, and that meant finding the right vendors. Yeah. I had to subcontract all this. It was all being wow. made in the States. So it was a real learning experience. Oh my God. I mean, there, I just like, I want to just touch on so many points. Like first, yeah, price. That's so huge, right? Like your initial thought, you're like, yes, this sounds great. High end, realizing, like, oh, we're not meeting our sales, dropping it out, dropping it down, and then sales exploded. But I think what's more, like what's also very interesting is, you know, you wanting to, you started hitting the doors and then got some feedback from certain people you're like well that's obviously not the direction that I'm going to go almost to this like 80 20 Pareto kind of thing where you hit the department right. you're so innovative you know that allowed you to really get market share and then you didn't over from an operational standpoint I think that this is what happens a lot with entrepreneurs is you 
produce the product first and then you really sell it, but then you had the problem to worry about after you sold it. Okay, now we get to get now we have to get operations really kind of being able to meet this, right? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Well, on, we we were lucky enough that we can make um, a, a a sample set, right, and show it, right, without running like the inventory because that's where your your money is is in inventory. I made mistakes in that area. I have to say I overdid it. Yeah. And I learned, right? Um, you know, about, we sold it in four years, but in my third year, when I knew what we were at a tipping point, I hired a very high level as a business coach. She was the former CEO of Kids R Us. Do you remember Kids R Us? Yeah. You might not. It was like Toys R Us and Kids R Us. It was like the kid clothing store, yeah. right? She was, she had, you know, like, became a, like this is early business coaching and I she was like super expensive but I knew I needed her thinking I knew I needed her because she she helped me merchandise and put together this whole line of fat like everything worked together that was something I didn't have the skills for at the time and that also helped me take it to another level so getting also help the help you need Right, I knew marketing. I knew nothing about merchandising, so I knew nothing about making making the sweaters. Right, yeah. those were big learning curves for me. Oh, absolutely. I think you know. I th I mean, I have experienced this on my own. Right, so you're good at one certain thing, and then you're like, okay, I can probably trudge along and make some strides, and then you see something, and then you're like, oh wait, now it's taken off, or now I've hit a roadblock, and you have to bring in other people. Yes. <laughs> you know, if you look at big corporations, it's not by one person, right? It's by tons of people. And I think, you know, probably a, a big thing with entrepreneurs is that, you know, more of a limited budget, thinking that they could do it all on their own and being able to, you know, be open-minded to realizing that, hey, you're never going to learn. You, you can't know it all. And you have to hire people kind of in their field of expertise. That is so key. You know, and I was that entrepreneur at first that I thought, well, you know, you start off, you have an idea, you think you can do it all. And then you make a few mis mistakes and expensive yeah. ones. Mm -hmm. That's, I, I mean, so many people come to me and when I, because I do branding work, yeah. that they'll go out, oh, I got to get a website. Oh, I got to get a logo. But they haven't done the real deep branding core work, right? And then they go out and then they don't get the traction and then they're backpedaling. Either they, the business fails, right? And they go on to getting their next thing or they go, okay, let's go back to the drawing board and, and really put our team together. I'm yeah. going to have to invest. I might have to raise some money too mm -hmm. to do that or I might have to borrow from friends and family. But when you get a, you know, a team together, Right, your core team, that's what can take your business to the next level. Oh, 100%. Well, can we, so, okay, so you sell your company, because I do want to talk to you a little bit about kind of your work as a business coach and all that kind of stuff. So you, you sell your company. Um, I know you've done a lot of other projects, but how, talk to us, I guess, about the evolution of selling that first business, getting into kind of business coaching and, and really helping, you know, entrepreneurs and executives internationally with branding. Uh, talk to us about that, and especially the the work that you do in the green market, which cannabis folks, yes, there is cannabis, <laughs> right? But it's not just cannabis green; it's something else. Yeah, yeah. So, all right. So, there's a couple of questions in there, right? Um, I know. A, um, I'll start with. Um, so, I you know, after I sold the company, right? I sold the company. I was a little burnt out by then because I did a I did a fast track four years. I didn't stop, right? I went go go go, girl, and I had that energy. <laughs> so, um, and then I took a little break and I said, what do I really want to do, right? Mm -hmm. I even did some, you know, I became a yoga teacher, right? I know that sounds like like what, but it actually it was more of a kind of meditative place I got into that, like I really started thinking and reflecting on. How, what, where I want to take all my skills and who do I really want to help, mm -hmm. right? I was good at marketing. I knew that. But that's how the green thing happened because I decided that, you know, I want to, if I'm going to do this again, do I want to start another products company? At that time, I said no. I was kind of like, I had a, like, I was done for yeah. that time period. But I did want to, I loved being an entrepreneur and I loved helping entrepreneurs. And I said, you know, there's a lot of entrepreneurs that need this kind of marketing help that I and, and business uh, coaching yep. and so um, I then decided like 
who do I really want to help? You know, I can't be everything to everybody. And that's when the green thing was like, it was sustainability and environmental companies that I first targeted because I had a deep passion of my own, right, uh, around that. And, and uh, being a kind of a nature girl, I wanted to like help the companies that were helping the planet, right? So that's when Mind Over Market, my current company, which is otherwise known as Mom, um, came into being. And I started helping companies that were doing, you know, gr amazing things for, for, you know, for people on the planet. And that felt really in alignment. And I, this way I could really like get into the marketing and help them in, the, in many different ways. How the other green showed up for me was one of the companies Growstone mm -hmm. has a fully, they, 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 I became their marketing department, right? They were a startup, a venture capital funded startup. Mm -hmm. And they, what they did was they take, they took out of um, landfills, right? Mm -hmm. Glass that would be discarded in landfills. And they had the contracts with the cities in, in New Mexico. They, and they took that glass and they milled it and baked it into this, little stone that was called grow stones and it was a way to grow plants and it was fully recyclable and it took off with indoor growers right mm -hmm. and that was their major market you know and at first they didn't mention that too much right <laughs> but it was I mean it wasn't what it is today and what, so what year uh, was that like in the cannabis because I right so let me think. It was a uh, 2010. Oh wow! Oh yeah, that was ten. Awesome. I worked from them from 2010 to 2016. Okay. Right, and we did you know from their branding, but then their whole social media. But you know, we we launched their Facebook page. It was crazy. Like within three years, we had forty thousand fans on oh, Facebook. Wow. Yeah. And so, and we did some obviously some. Yeah. Um, you know, back end uh, uh, targeting for that, but it was like you know taking off, right? And but the big the big deal was this: is that Growstone mm -hmm. was a very new product, mm -hmm. and the mar the the, the hydroponic uh, stores yeah. and growers had their recipe, right? And they were like, "I'm not going to screw up my recipe here because this is an important yeah. crop for me." And so, it, you know, we, we had to really strategically roll out in a way like, how can we get the growers to try Growstone? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so we, you know, we worked with that and we ended up sending samples to the stores in yeah. which the growers would go in and say, hey, do you have Growstone? Right? And oh, that's yeah. how we did that on, on social media. Yeah. But that was my first entry point into this marketplace, right? Yeah. And um, anyway. Um, and it came through an environmentally focused That's the best business. way. And yeah. How for you coming from, you know, Manhattan and like, you know, what was your relationship with cannabis at that time? Like, were you like, oh, goodness, or like what, like, I just mm. want to know kind of your cannabis journey uh, as an entrepreneur. Yeah. So, you know, when, when I started Mind Over Markets, which was in 20, uh, when did I do it? 2003. Okay. Mm -hmm. I made a decision that I was only going to work with products and services that I truly believed in. That was like my own core value, right? I am going to make sure. So back to cannabis is that even though it came around in a, in a way that I didn't like, I didn't go after the cannabis market. Yeah. I have a personal, I mean, it's a, it's a plant and it's a feminine plant yeah. and it's a healing plant. And it is, you know, the tremendous medicinal, you know, yes. qualities of this beautiful plant that's gotten taboo, you know, because of all that we know in the media. But now that it's opening up around the country and it will more, yeah. um, I come from that heart around it. So that's, I really, I believe in it. I believe in it as a way to help people and, you know, and the planet, right? And so when, it's, when I got involved in that market, and it was almost like it was calling me, because then I had other companies I started w working with, that I really felt, I had to think about it, right? Yeah. But I, from the very heart of it, I truly believe in its natural form. It is a gift mm -hmm. to humanity. 
Yeah, oh, and I, I completely that agree. makes me go, okay, so how can I do my part, yeah. you know, in helping promote this mm -hmm. in the way that feels in alignment with my own values? Oh, yes. Oh, I love it. Well, so that's like a perfect segue. Well, what do you think about <laughs> the branding right now in the cannabis industry? And let me preface it. What do you think about the evolution of branding in the cannabis industry 2010 to where we are today in 2018? You know, I'll tell you something. This was a little, this was a little disappointing to me. Um, I went, I'm in Seattle, right? And I went this past couple of months ago, I went to a Seattle cannabis show yeah. and I walked the show yeah. and it looked very similar to every other show I went eight years ago. And I was going, oh my goodness, I thought yeah. it had advanced more than it did. Mm -hmm. And I talked to some of my friends that were, um, you know, were there and, um, and uh, in, the, in the selling there, they had booths yeah. there. And they said something about that particular show, right? Okay. But, um, but it's not like a slam dunk, right? It's not a slam dunk. We're seeing changes in the market and more investors coming into the market, but I still think it has a ways to go. Mm -hmm. I think the branding need it needs to be re rethought, frankly. Yeah. You know, it has to be rethought. And I and I think a lot of it still lingers from the past. Mm -hmm. And I think there's an opportunity for products. Yes. Right? And especially for females. Yes. <laughs> products to totally, totally taken in a new direction. And I think a br some of the branding, I see some new products coming out that are feel that feel in alignment, yeah. right? Um, and one of them is this, a company called Right Sciences. And, um, oh, I don't know about them. Yeah, check it out. Sarah, her name is Sarah Blankenship. She's the CEO of that. But it's a, it's a cannabis and hemp. She has a hemp patch, right? you know like a healing patch yeah. right so you put it right on your arm and it gives you the medicinal effects right and um and she has she did her i didn't do the branding for her business but i looked at and she's like she's she's right on target this oh. girl knows what she's doing and i thought oh, this is really looks like the evolution of what can come down the road but as an industry i still think we have a ways to go Oh my gosh, I can I agree. Well, and what's funny is that you and I see different products because we're in different states, right? And so legally, you know, a cannabis unless they've got a licensing deal or something, a cannabis company, um, if they're in Washington, they're in Washington. So the product innovation is like that in Washington, product innovations like that in Oregon, California, and so forth. And so it's curious to see, like there's some interesting brands that um, you know, I was opening a cover of like MG magazine. Have you heard of that magazine? Yeah. And I opened it up and I was like, wow, there's some really interesting, some, some branding, but then I'll go as well to shows. And I just see something that looks like I did it and I'm like, <laughs> okay, right? Right. And I shouldn't be, you know? And so I look at it that there's, you know, how do you say it? This is the time to get your you're yes, because we are about to be federally legal in the next three or four years. And when I mean, just from your own experience of just like what you were able to do with Pucci, you, although your brand evolved, you had some brand identity and, and probably a very nice looking product. to sell, Yes, right? yes, yes. And yes, yeah. right on. Mm -hmm. So back to that, that this is the time if yeah. say if you want to set I wanted to sell my company in under five years I mean I before I made one collar and leash that was a goal of mine mm -hmm. and so everything I did was about that right I every every mess um, every uh, decision I made had that in mind yeah. okay so but that was a goal of mine that might not be a goal of everybody's yeah I, I often tell them I say even if you don't think you're gonna sell the company think about it that way it will hone your brand and what you're putting out there even more so instead of just saying oh I'm gonna do this forever yeah. um, but if you want to position your brand for yeah. that marketplace that is emerging right now right then you can't do it in a homespun way, right? You should really be doing it and thinking of it as a business yeah. and developing a brand and what that brand means in the marketplace and what your position in the marketplace is, the look and feel, the messaging around that. That's going to attract, right? Yeah. The 
companies and sometimes, and we'll, I know that's a double-edged sword So because some of the bigger companies are coming in and taking a look at this environment that there's a lot of money to be made, mm-hmm. right? And if that's one of your aspirations, then you, then, then to really um, build a brand. Oh, gosh, yeah. And I think I just want to tie this in to what you said at the very beginning of this podcast with your first entrepreneurial spirit, right? You were selling lemonade. Nobody knew about it. You had to, you <laughs> right. to tell people, hey, guys, we are selling a product. And in today's day and age, it is branding. You can't go parade millions of people in an hour. You do that through social media. You th- do that through digital right. marketing. But you have to have that beautiful brand or a brand that resonates um, with whoever you're trying to sell to. That's right. Exactly. Like I had, I had that table out with all our wares, but nobody knew about it. I can't tell you how many people say I made this amazing thing and I can't. And today's day and age with social media is a great tool, but we have ton, you know, breaking through the clutter of what out there is like, wow, that, that requires thinking and strategy work. Mm -hmm. Um, so, but you're right. You got to be able to get it out there in a way that people, that you're, you can attract your idea customer yeah. or client. Oh, definitely. So even if you have to bang on some pots and, pan, pots and pans along the way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, entrepreneurs are hustlers. We should be. Right. <laughs> what do you want me to do? <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, I even noticed it myself. Like, um, you know, so we're actually launching so many new things with CWEST, the Cannabis Women's Empowerment Society, and then also with Calogia. And so, of course, you can message people. There's the direct marketing Cannabis is a little harder with obviously Facebook ads, Instagram ads, all that kind of stuff. Doable, but right. I just noticed I'm going to go and just chat with people like the good old way. And you have to be strategic, kind of like the department store mentality of how do you get to exactly where you want to get to, you know, for the full results. I couldn't believe how, how effective that yes. was. <laughs> yes. You know what? You said something really important, Simone, like highly important that mm-hmm. people think, well, like I'm going to put you know, I'm going to put it out there on social, I'm going to do my email campaign. And all of those are really important. Mm -hmm. But the purse, the relationships that you build one on one, face to face is that including in my in my in my business, that is where I make most of my money, right? And the rest of that supports it, right? But it's a sliver of it, right? Where the old fashioned way of making those connections and then staying in contact with them, nothing can compare to that. Even in the day and age of, you know, internet and digital marketing, it's okay. still so that. Page. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, cool. Are you doing the right things? <laughs> yay, yay. So we only have one more question before the speed round, which is insane. So I'm like, oh, well, we'll have to see you again on the podcast soon. Okay. So one of the things also that I, that I, you know, since we've known each other, um, seems like it's much more of a calling right now for me is really helping a lot of women entrepreneurs. And I love, you know, when I was getting prepared for this and just like, I also know what you've been up to, but like really looking at some of the stuff that you work on and really helping women. And you have this, you know, this mentality that business is one of the most powerful forces on the planet for change. And as more and more women launch and grow sustainable businesses collectively, we can make a big economic and social impact and fast. And I was hoping, you know, it's an open-ended question, but if you could just elaborate on that and kind of how you see, like how how you see that framework and that mentality, you know, working or what still needs to work to actually have that happen fast right now. So for women and business, are you saying? Yeah. 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 So, you know, as a marketer, I know that 85% of the products that are bought in the United States, right? Consumer products are bought by women. That's 85%, $7 trillion a year. Are, we're the ones con- really when you look at it we're collectively the ones that can control this our economics yeah. right yeah. and sometimes we don't realize that say hey if we did something collectively and really mindfully yeah. we can change the game here right yeah. Yeah. So we business is such an integral part of our lives economics is such an integral part of our lives as more and more women are entering Mm-hmm. The business realm, the workplace, and especially uh, entrepreneurial, we can form the markets and the products 
and ha- like how we want to see it change, right? We yeah. still have a ways to go, right? Because we know at the very top, those CEO levels are, are still the very few women are there, 5% or less. However, that's why more women are leaving that corporate you know, uh, landscape and starting businesses of their own so that they can be like twice the rate of men yeah. that's happening. So I believe personally, business, it can be a force for good right on the planet. We always hear the evils of business, but we can actually create the world we want. And I believe it's women who will be leading the way in that. Yes. Oh, no, I, I completely agree. Okay, cool. Um, okay, you ready for the speed round? Yes. I'm not sure what that is, though. <laughs> okay. No, everyone always gets sort of, it's like all about you, right? So it's, ah! <laughs> it's and there's nothing embarrassing, so don't worry. Um, what is one piece of advice you would tell someone getting into the cannabis industry? Do your homework, right? Mm-hmm. Go and check out the trade magazines, like you said, Mar- you know, MJ, right? Go take a look at where the market is going. Right. Don't just like uh, come up with an idea and try to sell it. Do your homework. See the niche that you're filling. Right. See who else is out there doing what they they're you're doing. See how you're meaningfully different. If you have a product or service idea and um, go walk some of the shows, listen to your co- podcasts mm-hmm. and really entrench yourself in that market before you decide to spend your money. Don't do it on the fly right? Do your homework before you begin and then get some help that you need, right? Someone perhaps in the industry that knows how to navigate that and invest because that's an investment in you. Yes. Oh, that's excellent. Okay. What is your why? My why? (laughs) My why happened on a vision quest, right? This is, I might get a little choked up here, but it happened on a vision quest about 15 years ago. And I made a, okay, I'll get, this is a little personal. I made a pact with the great mother, the great feminine, whatever we want to call that, that I would be, I would be a gatekeeper and help move this planet to a more healthy and vibrant state, right? In, in the ways that I can. So it has a spiritual connotation for me. Yeah. But my bigger why is it, it's a feminine one. And I, when I left the, the uh, vision quest, it was like, I am going to help preserve the beauty and, and beauty and um, integrity of the planet mm-hmm. through the feminine. And that is my why. That's excellent. Well, that's a, that's a beautiful why. And, and you're doing it. You know what I mean? You're really doing it with the green impact, with helping women. I mean, that's excellent. Thank you. That is excellent. Thank you. Yes. Where do you see yourself and your companies and your endeavors and all the things that you're touching and helping a year from today? One year from today. Mm -hmm. Right? Why? That's not so far off. (laughs) Not as fast as going. One year from today today i my my goal is to get to really i'm working with corporations more and more mm-hmm. and it is to get into high level conversations with the 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 decision makers at the top mm-hmm. okay to help them and even sometimes persuade them to do the right thing Okay. And some of the work I do is stakeholder relations, right? In the environmental world. So it's almost like when you get to, you get to rent through Carolyn, an environmental activist (laughs) or environmental advocate, I should say. So my, my, my goal is to be in deeper conversations with, with high level business decision makers at the top. And it could be even government. Oh. So today I am going to a conference, an invitation only conference with Al Gore. So I am going to like, uh, my goal is to have a conversation with Al Gore. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'll figure it out. 
<laughs> we need you to help us with the environment. I don't think, you know, unfortunately with where the media is at, a lot of very informed people, including myself, don't really listen to it now. But the the environmental um, things that could be happening, right, well, that are already currently happening to our planet and, you know, what could happen by 2030 from a food shortage crisis to what's right. happening oceans to you know all these crazy things that are happening you know with this administration pulling back like natural resources i mean that's a real thing and when you see how the united states is run it's by it's run by corporations and that's just politics aside that's just lobbying we all know that yes um, so absolutely that's a, very, that's a very thank you for doing that because that is that's what we need really you need to be able to uh, hopefully you know be a strategic advisor to as many big corporations as you possibly can that is it you got it I, i'm already one for a, a company in new mexico and on at that level mm -hmm. and i've been working with them for about five years um and it's getting even more interesting as we get going so i would love to do that with more companies and yeah. and being able to help you know, a guide this or and and help decision makers to to be more informed and to make decisions on behalf of not just the corporation but all the but all the people on the planet. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, Carolyn. Are you, well, first, I'm sure a lot of listeners are like, "Well, what? What if I want to work with Carolyn? What if I want to contact her?" So, I guess the question is, are you taking on any? Are, are you open? Are you still working in the cannabis industry? I, I hope so. And helping. Yeah, I mean, I work for, pro like I said at the beginning, products and services yeah. that I love and believe in. So, yes, feel free to reach out. I just want to also invite people to yes. Women Up Green, which is an online community, yeah. right? And that's turning up the volume of the feminine voice in the green space. Um, and, and Mind Over Markets, which is my marketing company. And, and you can get in touch with me by emailing me at initial C, Carolyn Pars. My last name is P A R R S at mindovermarkets.com. And that's a way to get in touch. So just reach out, right? And uh, if there's a way I can help you with your business or thinking about it and, um, and, and, and positioning it well, I'm your girl. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much for joining this podcast. And thank you all so much for listening to Cannabis Business Minds. I'm your podcast host, Simone Samaluka Radzins with Calagia. Connect with me on Calagia.com and we will talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to today's show. This is your host, Simone Samaluka Radzins of Calagia.com. I hope that you find this episode entertaining and insightful. My goal is to educate all of you about this exciting business because knowledge is power. If you haven't already, head on over to Calagia.com to connect with me and to meet other business leaders in the professional cannabis community. Also, if you like this, please go into iTunes and leave the Cannabis Business Minds podcast a five-star review. See you next episode.